Okay. Well, hello and welcome everyone to the STEM Central webinar, Education Research 101, A Beginner's Guide for STEM Principal Investigators. My name is Tanya Siemens and I'm the manager of the STEM Central project. And I'm joined here by Dr. Kate Winter, who will be presenting today. I'm um, just really briefly, STEM Central is a community of practice for STEM undergraduate education. So we provide a platform for communication, for sharing resources, for connecting with your colleagues and peers, and building and improving under, for, for building and improving undergraduate STEM education. We have a website with, where we offer online resources, we offer webinars, and you also have the opportunity to blog, join discussion groups, and um, engage in co-learning and collaboration with your peers and colleagues. So I hope that you'll become a member of STEM Central and, um, and join the community. So now it's my pleasure to go ahead and pass the microphone over to Kate. She is going to be introducing herself today, so I'll just go ahead and, and do that. So welcome, Kate. Take it away. Great. Thank you, Tanya, and welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, a quick overview of today's uh, webinar. We will have about 30 minutes of content and we are holding time for questions at the end so we can have more of a dialogue um, time permitting. But we should have the time. I am going to be providing a very, very quick overview of educational research, but the focus of today's discussion is really going to be on the common and guidelines. And to cover the entire document in a half hour, it's going to be very brief, fairly high level, and fairly fast. So I will be having some pulse checks, uh, some different interaction points midway to gauge your engagement and to determine um, whether or not folks are more interested in certain aspects or another. And as best as possible at the end, we can go into more um, detail at the end. So a little bit about me and why you are listening to me today. Um, I have been working in educational research and evaluation for over 12 years. My areas of focus tend to be in gender and diversity in STEM, professional development for faculty, college student access and persistence, and institutional cultural change. So I worked with the University of Washington's NSF Advanced Program from 2003 to 2009. And I continued working on issues of faculty workload and institutional transformation with the American Council on Education for two years with their Alfred P. Sloan Foundation projects. And then I've been lead evaluator on numerous federally funded projects in K-12 education, as well as campus-based initiatives in higher ed, and even some projects for national associations. I've been an independent evaluator since 2013, and I am a member of the American Evaluation Association, and I adhere to their professional and ethical standards, and I follow both the What Works Clearinghouse standards, which were established by the U.S. Department of Education, and the Common Guidelines for Education Research and Development that are from the U.S. Department of Ed and NSF, and we we're talking about those today. And the reason that we're even having this webinar is that the STEM program officers approached STEM Central and asked them to host a webinar on the common guidelines and educational research broadly because it is becoming more of a focus. If you read the current um, post for the STEM, it's not just about providing the funding for scholarships, it's also to enhance and study effective curricular and co-curricular activities that support recruitment, retention, student success, and graduation in STEM. So the leaders with STEM wanted to make sure that you as program um, principal investigators, excuse me, feel comfortable with that side of them. So that is what we will be doing today. Um, the common guidelines that we're talking about are much, much, much broader than STEM. These are applicable to most, if not all, of the federally funded initiatives right now from the Department of Education, uh, NSF, many, many of the large funders. So our objectives today are to increase your awareness of the common guidelines for education research and development. Specifically, there are three broad categories of education research included, including six general types of research. So with those six general types, as I'm introducing them, we'll talk about the purpose of each of them, the very abbreviated theoretical and empirical justifications for why you would do one type instead of another, the abbreviated guidelines for what is expected to come out of these projects, the evidence that comes out of these projects, and the guidelines for external review and feedback. 
So very briefly, what is education research? Can I have a show of hands from the audience for who is a STEM background person? All right, hands going up pretty quick, and it looks like it's going to hit at least half. Okay, great, thank you. You can put your hands back down. Um, education research isn't rocket science, but it is its own unique form of research, and it does have different methodologies that it uses, mostly stemming from the social sciences, so anthropology, sociology, psychology, um, education schools obviously have been stepping up and having a role in this, and the focus is on educational processes and outcomes very broadly. Um, the research conducted under that umbrella of education research is intended to provide the evidence behind the so-called evidence-based practices, strategies, and interventions in education that uh, most funding agencies are seeking to fund now. And increasingly common is that you are expected to follow the guidelines that have been established by IES and NSF for both rigor and significance. So it's sort of raised the bar and standardized what they're expecting related to the education research component of most of these grants. So these include the What Works Clearinghouse standards, which are sort of the above and beyond the common guidelines we're talking about today, as well as the common guidelines. So quick interaction. We've got a short poll for you that will be popping up here. What was your background with the Common Guidelines for Education Research and Development prior to you joining this webinar today? All right, we've got votes coming in pretty quick. Looks like almost half have never heard of it, and there's a slim minority that have actually used it. For you folks, today's webinar is not going to offer much new um, to speak of. It really is going to be coming directly from the guidelines, and I will understand completely if you want to allocate your, your precious time to something else. So uh, we are only covering the common guidelines today. So if you've not only read them but used them, you, you may want to um, exit at this point, and we will not take it personally. Um, but for the rest of you, this should provide an excellent introduction to what is available in this resource. Uh, it really is a, a fabulous guide as you're developing both your proposals and your component for the research, educational research piece. Um, this presentation, full disclosure, is pulled verbatim from the Common Guidelines in many, many places. I just repackaged it in a slightly different order to facilitate uh, a quick introduction to it. So when you have time, I highly encourage you to bookmark this website, um, review the full document, go back to it when you're ready to write a proposal. It almost could work as a checklist for things you need to think about, things you need to include, um, and it covers much more ground than we can cover in this introductory uh, webinar. So, and it also, in the appendices, has concrete, actual, real-life examples of each of the research types with each of the different components we'll be addressing today, the purpose, the justifications, the evidence. So I highly encourage you to find this resource and be able to go to it when you're ready to apply the knowledge. And again, if you've already used them, you may actually want to leave. We will not take it personally. You're welcome to stay. So the assumptions behind the common guidelines that are written into the document are that while these six research types generally follow a sequence of development from very foundational to more um, impact analysis, that knowledge development is not necessarily linear and can be informed from various places along that continuum. So they don't have to, you don't have to necessarily progress from um, research type one to two to three. Um, you can move in and out as appropriate for what you're investigating. Investigations can also skip phases. So, um, example, the technology, the MOOCs, have made large-scale testing possible um, prior to doing small-scale testing. It's not needed to do more cost-effective small-scale testing before doing large-scale because MOOCs make large-scale testing very economical. 
So it's it's possible to skip um, depending on what data you have available and the, the, the details behind what you're doing. They also recognize that single studies or projects may include aspects from more than one research type. So the examples that they give is that like a design and development research project might include a small scale study to assess the efficacy of what you're looking at. Or your efficacy research might engage in design and development cycles to improve the intervention that you're looking at. And that foundational studies could include any of the elements. So you don't have to have um, only one research type to pigeonhole your project within. Hey, Kate, I just want to, sorry, this yes. is funny. I wanted to just uh, chime in here. We did have a little clarifying question. Um, what Perfect. does IES stand for? Oh, it figures someone would ask that, and I can't remember off the top of my head. It is the, I'm going to Google it quick. Um, it's part of the Department of Education. And it stands for. Uh, is it um, Institute of find it first? Sciences? Yes, Institute of Education Sciences, exactly. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> A pop quiz for me. <laughs> so, without further ado, the first of the broad categories within the Common Guidelines for Education Research are the foundational research and early stage or exploratory research types of projects. So there are two different research types within this, this category and they are foundational research or early stage or exploratory. And they are designed to contribute to our core knowledge. So that foundational, that fundamental understanding, that real base level from which everything else can be built upon related to education broadly. So whether that's understanding teaching and learning, whether it's talking about um, how educational systems operate, whether it's looking at um, various models within education, uh, it's very, very broad and it's really related to that basic knowledge that we build upon. The second category is design and development research. And these are intended to actually develop solutions. So the foundational and early stage may have identified very clearly what some problems are. The design and development are designed to start working for solutions. So whether there's a goal related to you know, some educational outcome or improving student engagement, um, it's really looking at how can we help achieve those desired goals. And these represent research type number three. And each of these will be going into um, individually. The third broad category are the impact studies. And these contribute to how we know what's working or not working, it, to that evidence of impact. So they generate reliable estimates of whether or not a fully developed intervention will have the intended outcomes that it's um, designed to achieve. So these include um, three different research types, efficacy research, effectiveness research, and scale-up research. So quick interaction point, it's our second poll, which of the statements that you see are true? Votes are rolling in. Thank you all. All right, we've hit the majority. Um, absolutely, there are six different research types, and no one fell for the the, the trip up question. Um, projects do not have to fall within a single research type, and. Um, Getting into this education research stuff is actually really, really exciting because it allows you to your efforts are having the impact that you want them to. So I highly encourage you to start um, finding some love for this type of data. It is very different 
from most STEM research from what I've learned from my STEM colleagues, but it is really exciting to be able to quantify what outcomes your efforts are having because so much of our, our lives and attention and passion are focused towards improving these educational outcomes. It really is great to be able to know concrete evidence, what is working and why, and how that can be replicated elsewhere. So getting into the specifics of the six different research types, our first research type is foundational research. And these, again, provide that fundamental knowledge that may contribute to improving learning or other relevant education outcomes, whether that's diversifying your STEM classrooms, um, getting you know, more diverse students to succeed so that they're ready for the STEM workforce. Whatever is going wrong broadly in education, this looks to find out you know, to define it, basically, to describe it, to understand it better. These types of projects seek to test, develop, or refine theories, whether of teaching or learning, uh, or of, you know, again, diversifying our classrooms. It's very, very broad related to education. And they also may develop innovations in methodologies or technologies that can enhance or inform research and development in different educational contexts. So again, these are very basic knowledge points, figure something out for the first time kinds of projects. Their purpose is to advance the frontiers of education and learning very broadly. Um, again, to develop and refine theory and methodology and to provide that fundamental knowledge that can be built upon for either improving teaching and learning, improving the diversity of our uh, students, improving the diversity of our faculty, whatever is going wrong in the educational arena, these help provide that fundamental knowledge behind it. So when you are proposing a foundational research project, the key unique aspect of the justification is that it needs to address something important, some practical research research problem or question related to education broadly or learning or you know some specific aspect and they need to outline the theoretical and empirical basis for why you think it's necessary why should this project be conducted and what do you think it'll provide you know if, if you finish this what will we know how will it further our core knowledge so those are the um, reasons why people do foundational research projects the evidence that is expected to come out of foundational research are advances in theory, methodology, or just the understanding of these important constructs in education or in learning specifically or different aspects, and to provide those findings that can serve as the basis for future work. So these really provide that foundation for moving on to either um, early stage testing or design and development or efficacy, they all are based on these early types of, of research projects. And the foundational research projects are the only type of research included in the common guidelines that do not have an explicit connection to education outcomes. So you can use a foundation, well, yeah, excuse me, foundational research project to examine a phenomenon or something that's going wrong and you're not necessarily expected to have any closer understanding to well this is being caused by that or you know this relates to that it's more the descriptive this is what's going on so they this is the only type of research that does not have that explicit connection to an educational outcome Research type two are the early stage or exploratory research. And similar to the other form of the foundational or early stage studies, they are sort of that early look at what's going on related to problems in education. These examine relationships among some of the constructs. So whether it's looking at challenges related to diversity or the background that students come in with or whatever, whatever constructs are identified largely from the foundational projects. And the point is to establish some logical connections between those constructs and even um, with educational outcomes to form the basis for future interventions. So if we learn that you know, students coming out of high school without the required math skills tend to look like you know, these different categories and you know, those need to be addressed in order for the students to be prepared to succeed in math at the college level, that can then lead to some logical interventions to help 
target additional resources to bring those students up to speed. So the connections that are found typically are correlational rather than causal. So as we talk about other studies in a few minutes, they really look at causal. And you really need to structure a study so that you can tell, you know, the treatment group had this outcome, the control group had this outcome, therefore we can make solid claims that the intervention that the treatment kids got led to the differences that we are seeing. The early stage exploratory does not have that expectation. It's just, a, you know, increase in Y re relates to an increase in X. Um, we don't necessarily know whether X or Y is the, the trigger. So that's the, the unique piece for the early stage or exploratory. Their purpose, again, is to investigate approaches, so an intervention or some strategy, to an education problem to establish a basis for designing and developing a new intervention or strategy, and then also to provide evidence for whether an established intervention is ready to be tested in an efficacy study. So those are the two key purposes behind these early stage or exploratory projects. When you're proposing an early stage or exploratory project, the key unique justification is that they must address a practical education problem and provide a compelling case for how the study will inform either the development, the improvement, or the evaluation of um, programs, policies, or practices in education. And then the products, the evidence coming out of early stage or exploratory research that's expected relate to empirical evidence about those associations between factors we can change and the student learning outcomes, a well-specified framework behind these associations, so this gets to some of the theory behind why X and Y are, are related, and having a clear, compelling justification for either proceeding to a design and development project to actually build the intervention that you found the need for, skipping straight to an efficacy study to further test the intervention that you've identified, or if additional foundational or early stage research is needed first. So it's really that turning point, and at the end of these projects, you'll have the evidence to really recommend which direction to go. So the third interaction point, just to show a hands, uh, who has engaged in a study or project that would be considered foundational research or early stage or exploratory research? Got a few hands going up. Great. These studies really do provide that necessary information for being able to craft appropriate interventions and to know where to put your, your time and resources. So, great, thank you. You can put your hands back down. The third research type are the design and development research projects, and these draw on existing theory and evidence so that you can design and iteratively develop, that's the key, key part of these, iteratively develop an intervention or strategy um, to have the desired outcome that you're hoping to build that solution. Um, these can include pilot tests of fully developed interventions, but using them in a different venue. So let's say that this very successful uh, program in physics has been found to be just amazing at recruiting women, and now we want to see if that will translate into computer science or math or you know, chemistry. So finding a different um, condition to test an intervention that's been proven in a different condition. So we can do pilot tests of those through the design and development research and iteratively modify them so that they are effective. And the results typically lead to either additional work to better understand the foundational theory, or they show that the intervention or strategy is promising and that additional testing is warranted and the appropriate next step. So the purpose behind design and development research are to develop those new or improved interventions or strategies to achieve well-specified learning goals or objectives. And learning goals and objectives are very broad. And again, we're talking anything going wrong in education. It just needs to be well-specified. You can't just say, well, we're going to improve student outcomes. That's, that's pretty vague. They want a very specific focus 
and they want very clear understanding of how your project will address getting there. So there are um, four components to these, and it's basically just that you must design, um, you know, your iteration, and you know, keep track of what you're doing. If we've got time, we can go into these at the end. Um, they map to the outcomes that we'll talk about in a second. The justifications behind this type of research. So when you're proposing one, you really need to explain why the proposed project should lead to the desired outcomes whether that's you know, improving something going wrong in education or increasing efficiencies in the system, definitely above and beyond what current practice provides. So basically, there is something going wrong. This is why we need to fix it. We think this project is that fix, but we need to design and develop it and you know, get it perfected before it's ready for full-scale testing. The evidence that comes out of design and development research projects include your fully developed version of the proposed design or research. So you propose in your design and development um, grant that you will build something and you've got a pretty clear idea of what you think it's going to be, but then you iteratively tweak it and test and tweak and test until you find that, that perfect combination and you have your fully developed version. So that fully developed version is one of the pieces uh, of evidence or one of the outcomes that's expected. Um, additionally, you will have created a well-specified theory of action. So why is what you're doing having the desired effect? And typically this comes mostly from literature, from the foundational projects, from some of the, the social theories. But now that you're working with it through the duration of this project, you've got a very clear understanding of how things are working together. You also have descriptions of any major changes that you made, and you have the evidence to support or question the key assumptions that you went into related to the theory of action. So just basically keeping track of your work, they want to, the funding agents want to see that. You also will come out with a description and the empirical evidence of adjustments that resulted from the design testing. And you will have created measures. This is key. As you are designing your intervention, you probably have data in mind that shows there's a problem, whether that's high attrition, whether it's you know um, drop-fail grades, whether it's the um, lack of diversity in your classrooms. What, whatever data points you have that show there's a problem typically become fabulous ways to know whether you fixed the problem. So through this process, you also will have created some metrics to be able to test quantitatively the quality of whether or not your intervention has worked. So that is a huge piece um, that's expected to come out of these projects are the measures, the metrics that can be used to assess the impacts. Um, so that is a, a big piece. And you also then have the data demonstrating the project's success because you will have been piloting and figuring out what you need to keep track of and, and what matters. So that pilot data will show whether the intervention has promise or whether additional work um, is needed. Ideally, you will have worked out the kinks before the end of the, the project. Show of hands, who is engaged in a study or project that would be considered design and development research? Pretty good number of hands going up. And again, these are so crucial to helping build the interventions that we then go on to test on small scale and large scale and be able to replicate in different venues. So great. Thank you all. With the fourth research type, we enter into the last categories, or the impact studies. And the first type of impact study is considered efficacy research. And these allow for testing of the strategy or intervention that has been designed, likely through a design and development project. They are tested within ideal circumstances. So this is that happy bubble where you're protected from the messiness of real life. Typically, you have additional staffing. You might have the creator of the intervention on site to assist. Um, typically, you have a, a single population, so you're not dealing with the, the messiness of a very heterogeneous population. Um, it really is ideal for testing whether or not something works. Their purpose is to determine whether or not the intervention can achieve the desired outcomes under those ideal conditions, because if it can't work under the best 
possible operating conditions, there's no point in investing any money in having it fail under normal conditions. So this is sort of the, the opportunity to test whether something could work at all ever. And when you're proposing one of these projects, you need to be able to compellingly explain why this ideal circumstance bubble is the appropriate way to test. And similar to the other types, you also have to have evidence from prior studies or implementation that supports the value of the intervention itself, but still why additional testing is needed. So that's sort of the, the basic and then the specific component to efficacy research gets to why these ideal circumstances are the best way to go about it. The evidence that comes out of efficacy research is the same for all of the impact studies. So I'm going to be covering these for all three right here. Um, the first is the final report needs to cover everything outlined in the What Works Clearinghouse standards. So that is a separate document. Um, if you've had experience with that, um, you'll understand that it's not for the, the faint of heart. It's sort of research, um, educational research advanced. Um, for you sciencey types, the Greek formulas are probably the most comforting part. Um, but the, the standards are fairly high for what needs to be in the reports and what counts as evidence. So part of the report are the estimates, so reliable estimates of the intervention's average impact. So across the students involved, what was the average improvement or whatever you were hoping to improve, what was that average impact across the population that you tested it with. And ideally, most of the projects that we're working with, we have subgroups of interest, typically either um, female students in STEM or underrepresented students um, of either gender. And in many cases, it's very appropriate to keep track of those subgroups and whether the average impact on them differs from the, the whole. So perhaps your intervention has you know, fabulous results for um, women of color, but for some reason, the men of color really didn't show any changes. So it, it helps to understand what the intervention's impact is on specific groups. Um, the, the theme basically behind the What Works Clearinghouse is what works for whom and under what circumstances. So this helps tease out those specifics. You also need to include in your report the implementation details. So what did you do? When did you do it? Um, so that people can see that sort of audit trail and be able to replicate it as appropriate. Um, for both the intervention and your counterfactual condition. Your counterfactual condition are the students that don't get, or students or, or whatever your, your population is, who don't get the condition. So they're the, the control group, the comparison group, um, whatever you want to call it. They are business as normal. They don't get the new uh, intervention that you're testing. And ideally, you are randomly assigning students to the different groups so that it, um, helps understand you know, all the, the messiness of the students coming in. We had a question yesterday about troubles in STEM with attrition. If you're losing a lot of students in general from STEM as a whole, how do you keep them in your study? Because if you lose too many students in your study, it undermines your ability to know whether or not you had an impact. So ideally, if you're randomly assigning students to the intervention and your counterfactual group, you'll have the same proportions exiting if they do exit, and that actually helps with your um, workarounds for attrition if you're not losing all of one group and not the other. So keeping track of, of all of what you've done is huge. And then the last piece are the implementation, yeah, I'm losing the ability to talk, implications. Thank you. It's been a long day. Um, before you questions? move on to implications, um, I was wondering, we do have a quick clarifying question. From Janet, sure. she asks, what is the What Works Clearinghouse? All right. Um, I was going to say Big Brother, but that's really too harsh. Um, it's really designed to be a resource, first and foremost. So it's meant to be a clearinghouse of literally what works. So not just promising practices, but proven practices in education. And to meet their threshold for you know, showing that um, 
level of success, they have various requirements. Um, you can have three different outcomes from their review in order to make it into their database for um, projects that work. You can meet their standards without reservation, that's the gold. You can meet their standards with reservations, that's sort of the silver, and you can not meet their uh, um, standards, which isn't even really bronze. You, it's just that's, that's not, it's not good. And they have um, different um, sort of a point system, depending on what type of approach you used in your educational research, um, only random control trials with certain levels, um, minimal levels of attrition can achieve the uh, meets the standards without reservations. Um, Non-randomized studies can meet it um, with reservations and RCTs that have too high of attrition can also meet the standard with reservations and there's different size requirements, different numbers of, of participants, institutions, there's, there's a whole host of, of different things that they look at in order to count as having a successful project. So a lot of federally funded projects are starting to follow those standards because you want to show that level of rigor and that level of significance. So again, they are much more advanced than the common guidelines and the information provided. Um, but if you have time and you have the interest, um, it's very interesting to look at how the government is treating um, different types of projects. Unfortunately, the majority of what works tend to fall under quantitative approaches because they are easier to aggregate across projects and um, the qualitative, I think, somehow loses out. I, I think there's, there's significant value in getting qualitative data and hearing the voices of the people we're trying to help and work with, but the What Works Clearinghouse really doesn't have a lot of room for that. So that's sort of the What Works Clearinghouse in a nutshell. Um, we really we can have a little bit of time um, at the end. Um, we're towards the end. Um, so if, if we have time, we can go into those if that's what people are interested in. But it is, it's a very fascinating process and it's where a lot of the education research and the funding behind it is going. But um, just to finish out the efficacy, or the, actually the evidence to be produced by all of the impact studies, the last piece are the implications of your findings for theory of action. So typically you will either find um, favorable impacts and then you will have all the replication information for other people to do what you did and have the same great outcomes. Or if you don't demonstrate favorable impacts, you might have or should have the possible reasons why. So, excuse me, if someone else attempts to do a similar project, they can avoid those same pitfalls or maybe the challenges that you faced in your specific circumstances aren't re relevant in a different circumstance, so they might not have the same problems. So those are the two different outcomes and the um, implications that are required. The next two research types will go pretty quickly because they're very similar to efficacy. Effectiveness research examine the effectiveness of a strategy under normal operating circumstances. So their purpose is to get the estimate of impact in routine practice, nothing special, um, you know, no safe bubble to experiment within. And um, when you're proposing one of these, the unique piece is explaining why testing under routine circumstances is warranted. So again, these tend to be fairly small sample. The effectiveness research might have a little bit more diverse of a population than the efficacy, which again are in that protected bubble where you can have a single you know, population. These might be a little bit more diverse, but they don't necessarily um, have any larger of an impact, or not impact, larger of a sample. And then the final type of research are the scale-up research projects. And these, again, examine the effectiveness of an intervention, but this time across a wide range of either populations, contexts, circumstances, and again, without that protective bubble. So there's no substantial developer involvement. Um, there's, there's no above and beyond the normal conditions. These are routine operating conditions. They're just big. And again, the purpose is to estimate the impacts, this time across a very broad spectrum. 
So when you are proposing one of these, the unique piece is that you need to explain why routine circumstances and broad sample is appropriate. And then the final piece is applicable across all of the six research types. These are the guidelines for external review and feedback. So each of the research types we've talked about should be subject to a series of external critical reviews from the design process, the implementation, uh, the analysis, and your reporting. External reviews should be independent and rigorous. You will want to talk to your program officer about what exactly counts. Um, the, again, the common guidelines are federal, so they are beyond NSF, they're beyond STEM. So some funded projects specify that you have to have someone off your campus. Some just need to show that it's not part of your project. So if you have an external office on your campus that does review, you can have them do your review. Uh, it really depends on your project or your, the, the funding stream. Check with your program officer. And then appropriate review activities include peer review of your project proposal, ongoing monitoring and review by your grant making personnel, which typically you don't have a lot of control over. They're going to do it anyway, but it, it counts as one of your, your review and feedback channels. Um, having an external review panel or advisory board is becoming very common. You get that expertise. You get the guidance. And then a uh, third party evaluator. Can, can work with you, again, whether that's on your campus or off. And then peer review of any publications or conference presentations, any dissemination that comes out of your project that hits the level of peer review counts towards your external review and feedback requirement. So last interaction before we open it up for the q and I think we're going to have 15 minutes left. Who is engaged in a study or project that would be considered an impact study? So either efficacy, effectiveness, or scale up. All right, a few fewer hands than the others. So either I've, I've lost the audience or these just aren't as common. So just to recap, we covered the common guidelines with their three categories of research, foundational or early stage, design and development, and impact studies. And it is OK to mix different approaches in a single project if it makes sense to do so. So like anything you're proposing, you need to have a justification behind it. So those were the common guidelines in a nutshell. Um, we do have a little over 15 minutes now for questions and comments. Uh, Tanya will read off the ones we've received through the question box, but if you would like to raise your hand, it looks like we've got a couple hands up. Um, so you might want to check. If you don't really mean to have your hand up, you might want to put that down now. Um, otherwise, we will unmute you and you can ask a question. Thank you so much, Kate. That was a wonderful presentation. And yeah, I will go ahead and moderate the question answer session now. A few questions came in before you finish your presentation, so we'll go ahead and take those first. But I do see some hands raised, so I'm looking forward to unmuting you guys and letting you ask your questions out loud. So there's a question here from Anat Kirkredi. He asks, does the uh, what works clearinghouse gives specific quantified standards and different levels of attainment? Uh, if I understand the question correctly, I would say yes. Um, they have guidelines for statistical power, for error, for everything you can think of um, for showing the um, impact of your projects. And if you meet things at different levels, you can either hit the meets with reservations, meets without reservations, or does not meet the standards. I also noticed that um, Anat does have his hand up, so I'm going to go ahead and unmute him in, in case he wants to. Or, Anat, do you want me to unmute you so you can talk? If not, you can take your hand down. Okay. Oh, he took his hand down. No, it's back up. I'm going to unmute him. <laughs> there we go. All right, go ahead, Anat. You can talk now. I'm not hearing enough of your question. I apologize. You mentioned there are some standards. How should, how does one go about selecting the standards that these are appropriate and these are not? 
oh, I was not involved in that. Those were some high-level folks with the Department of Education and many educational research experts. I'm sure it was a rigorous process, but I'm not prepared to um, talk in depth about it. I, I didn't do my homework on that for this presentation. Okay. Thank you for the question. Um, I'm going to mute him now. And then the next question from Karen Krapcho. She asks, are the goals um, of the of the wet works to disseminate best practices with conclusive education studies and how large is the list of positive studies? Oh, great question. Um, yes, the goal is to create that clearinghouse of proven practices in education, whether it's K-12, higher ed, across the spectrum. Um, they have been focusing mostly on K-12 so far because a lot of the funding went that direction with No Child Left Behind. Uh, my understanding is they are seriously backlogged on not only the higher ed but also some K-12 research, so um, if you have a study in mind, so let's say um, um, an institution in California has this great mentoring program and you've read a couple of their articles and you really want to model your project after that, but their study isn't listed in the clearinghouse yet, you can touch base with the clearinghouse and recommend that they review a study. And then they'll bump it up in their queue and look at it um, so they, I'm, I'm not sure how large the list is currently. It is growing all the time. They have a continuous review process and several different teams reviewing um, studies, but it is slow and they are backlogged. Okay, thank you. Um, and the next question is from um, Ali Yadav, and I apologize if I'm getting your name wrong, but um, Ali asks, is there a research type that is most often used by STEM proposals? That is a very interesting question. I'm not sure specifically with the STEM. The common guidelines do make explicit that there's no set quota or portion of funding that goes to different types of research at any different time. They just take whatever proposals come in and fund by merit. So I'm, I'm not sure if STEM, um, it would depend on what is appropriate to explore. So connected to the goals of STEM, if there's still room for foundational exploration, I would suggest proposing your new idea related to that early stage knowledge. Otherwise, jump in across the continuum with what makes sense. But I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if there's a, a typical type used so far. Okay, thank you. And um, now let's go ahead and go to some of the hands that are raised. I'm going to unmute uh, Deborah Hydorn. So get ready, Deborah. I'm going to unmute you now so you can um, ask your question because your hand is raised. We go. Okay. All right, Deborah, go ahead. The hand just oh, went down. Went down. Okay. <laughs> I have this effect on my yeah. students. Are you? Did you want to ask a question, Deborah? Okay. Well, I'm, I'll mute her again. Let's go to um, Christy Martis. Going to unmute you, Christy. If you want, if you don't want me to, you can put your hand down. <laughs> oh, there goes her hand. <laughs> now put your hand down if you don't want me to unmute you. Well, I'll go. Let's take one of the typed questions so people can evaluate, look at this, see if they want to put their hands down. Um, we have a question from um, um, Ermi, Ermi, <laughs> Gosh, Das uh, Tadar, and he was. Um, Oh, he said he would be interested in additional webinars of the first three research, research types. Fabulous. Um, Tanya, do folks indicate that to you? Um, we are doing these based on interest and funding. So we have asked NSF to cover, they're very economical, but there, there are resources involved. And we are prepared to offer much more in-depth webinars on any of the research types with more concrete examples, which again, you can find in the appendices. But we were going to be able to talk sort of real time with folks. So we would like to offer those, but they are not currently scheduled at this time. OK, thank you. Um, the next question. Um, 
comes from, um, I think I actually, I asked that one, asked that one already, okay. Um, Ermi also asks, can you please recommend some articles that evaluated previous NSF STEM grants? That might be something Another to follow excellent. up with. Yeah, not, um, not off the top of my head, <laughs> um, but I could certainly look into that. Um, I'm making myself a note. Yeah, this would be something we could definitely post in um, on STEM Central. We are, we're going to have a, a resource page for this webinar where we can begin to accumulate um, some more documents and um, address, I guess, some of those questions that we can't address right away. We can post responses to those questions on STEM Central and let you know where they are. Let's see, we still have some hands raised. So I'm going to um, um, Mihaela Sabin. Would you like to ask a question? Your hand is up. Oh, going down. <laughs> and the final hand that's up is, oh, is hand still up. So I'm going to go ahead and unmute you, Mihaela, so you can ask a question. All right, there you go. Did you want to ask a question? Oh, okay. I guess there's a kind of a, um, a technical problem with GoToWebinar and some people's hands show that they're up, but they're actually not. So um, it's okay, no worries. Let's see, we mm -hmm. have another question from Justin Pruneski. He asks, um, it seems like the efficacy studies under ideal conditions would be diff difficult to do. Are they common and are they expected? Very interesting question. Um, not necessarily expected. Nothing is expected except that you find the best balance for the project you want to do and then pitch it appropriately. As far as whether or not they're difficult to structure, it depends on what you're doing and who you're doing it with. So if you already have a sort of homogenous group of students working in a first year course or a, a gatekeeper type of entry level course and you can sort of only look at that group and again you're um, still have to have a comparison group but they would be very similar in that sort of um, homogeneity. Um, if you already have a group that fits that sort of ideal, then having the developer for the program you want to implement and having those sort of safety nets in place, it's not, not as difficult as you would think. Um, and they are appropriate for some things that may be the more innovative, risky, you don't just want to go live with it in regular operating conditions. Um, but there's certainly no expectation for any of the different impact studies. It's really what makes the most sense for what you're hoping to, to explore. Okay, great, thank you. Um, we, have a we also have a question from uh, Janet Callahan. She asks, what does this webinar relate or overlap with this STEM call? So what categories of research do you think the call is asking for, if any? Um, the STEM like call for proposals itself. Um, I think that the reason that the STEM program directors contacted STEM Central to provide this overview is just because there's the growing expectation for the educational research component. So it's not specific to any different type of research um, as far as you know the early stage or um, effectiveness. It's really just that you need to be more cognizant and intentional with structuring not just what you're doing but also how you're evaluating it and sort of studying what the impacts are. So I, I don't think there's any going there's going to be any specific call for a specific research type. Um, it's really just more raising the awareness that this is an expectation that is growing. Um, some of the earlier STEM awardees didn't have as much of this behind them, but as NSF is becoming much more interested in empirical evidence related to the, the funding outcomes, which I think is across the board federally, taxpayers want to know that their dollars are going to good purposes, so their expectation for having proof 
of what those outcomes were has risen. So I don't think that there's any specific call for a type of research. It's more just the expectation of some form of research, if that answers your question. Thank you, Kate. And I, um, those of you who ask these questions, please feel free to type in follow-up um, questions into the question box if you would like more clarification. Um, and I do have some some hands raised. So um, Catherine Chen, ha your hand is raised. And so um, if you would like me to unmute you. Oh, hands went down. <laughs> and then also just wanted to make sure um, Anat Kirketty, your hand is also up. And so um, I will go ahead and unmute you in a few minutes um, if it's still up, <laughs> because I want to give you a chance to put it down if you're if it's in, unintentional. Okay, it's going down again. So um, there, okay. those are just unintentional hands. But we do have one final question, um, and please feel free to add more. But we have a question from um, Perry Vizano. He asks, um, or her, I'm not sure. Um, how would an STEM proposal that awards scholarships to select students implement? Like for example, female students, how would that proposal implement a random selection slash control research? It seems we are limited to efficacy studies. Please comment. Well, first off, um, if you want to meet the What Works Clearinghouse standards for any of the three types of impact studies, they do have that um, very, very high bias towards the random assignment studies. So efficacy is your safe bubble, but it doesn't protect you from the random assignment. And typically, you would want to find an appropriate way. If you've got the target females that are eligible for your scholarship, basically you would need to divide that pool in half randomly and half would get the scholarship and the other half would not. Um, that probably will limit the number of those females that don't get scholarships coming in. I recognize that. It's one of the major challenges with conducting these types of studies in higher education, but you would want to find that, that best balance between reality and the RCT structure. So is there a way that you could uh, randomly assign the students that get the treatment or your scholarships and the ones who don't and still have them in? Sometimes that's eligibility, but they were never offered the scholarship. So they don't realize that they're missing out on it. Um, so if you already had a pool of females that look very similar to the ones that get your scholarship for whatever reason, um, there, there are ways to make it happen. Um, I'm not saying it's easy necessarily, but efficacy studies will not protect you from that um, expectation. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we did get one more question in from Ali Yadav. Um, does there seem to be an emphasis from NSF to design evaluation that meets the what works um, clearinghouse standards? I haven't heard that explicitly, but the fact that we were asked to cover the common guidelines which end with the punchline of your final report should meet WWC standards really hints that they may be going in that direction. So I don't want to be alarmist, but you might want to consider it. Again, it depends on program, so you can check with STEM. Um, I certainly have done other advanced, or not advanced, NSF projects that do not have that expectation just because it's, it's not appropriate in all cases to do RCTs. Um, even even quasi-experimental studies um, where you're doing a matched comparison group that was not randomly assigned. Um, which is basically what I was just talking about with the females not getting the scholarship. You already have this group of similar females who are here um, that were never you know, even applying for the scholarship, but they're close enough in all these demographics that they could have been the students that we gave our scholarships to. Um, so again, it's, it's not necessary to panic and immediately expect that that's where everything has to go. It's just being aware that as the expectations for evidence and empirically sound um, replicable findings increases that it likely will go that direction. Okay, thank you again, Kate. Um, oh, here's another question <laughs> um, from Leah Gold. 
What is the average number of students in these studies? My current pro program only takes five to seven students a year. It seems it would be very hard to draw a conclusion about such a small number of students, even if I could take 10 students and randomly assign a scholarship <laughs> to five of them. Absolutely, Leah, um, and that is the other significant challenge behind doing education research in these types of settings. So I don't have an average um, across projects. It really varies depending on the, the funding stream and what the intended outcomes are. Um, there are, are federally funded projects that are looking now at cost per student, so they really want to hit as many students as possible with the fewest resources as possible. Um, in your situation, that would be very, very challenging. You are not going to have enough headcount to have statistical power for years, even if you compile everything. So um, just keep keep track of stuff, even if it's, it's almost at that anecdotal level where your sample is so small, you don't have the statistical power to concretely show that this was the impact. You can still show what the impact seems to have been and whether it seems to have been positive um, based on the, the findings that you have. So I, I absolutely, I hear you, and it, it's part of that challenge of applying these new many times uh, theoretical construct um, lofty ideals into the real messy world of education research. And, um, and then I'm not followed up with a question, um, could small sample size projects be done as case studies? Absolutely, absolutely. And um, case studies don't fit necessarily cleanly into any of the research types covered in the common guidelines, but obviously they are a, a tried and true form of educational research. So they will provide very useful information for understanding whether something seems to be working in a particular context or not, which does get to um, potentially either an um, early stage type of study or a design and development type of study or even a, a really, really small scale impact study. So I, I, I agree with you that that would be an appropriate approach. And I apologize we've gone over on time, but I do want to address comments and help this be applicable for folks. Well, thank you so much, Kate. I don't see any more questions flowing in, and so um, I think that would indicate it's the conclusion of this webinar. And so I want to thank <laughs> you so much, Kate, for taking the time to share your expertise regarding evaluation, and also thanks to all the attendees who joined us today. Um, I hope that you all um, visit us on STEM Central and join if you're not already joined, and um, see you at the next webinar. I'll go ahead and stop recording and um, and close Thank out. Thank you all. So thank you so much.